Welcome to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network CRE PN Radio. Thanks for joining us. My name is Jade Aaron Gross. This is the podcast focused on commercial real estate investment and risk management strategies. Weekly, we have conversations with commercial real estate investors and professionals who provide their experience and insight to help you grow your real estate portfolio. Today, my guest is John Bell. John is an IT professional turned real estate investor. Uh, he's a, uh, he specializes in vacation rentals. And today we're going to speak with him about Airbnb. He's also got a uh, podcast. He hosts the podcast Vacation Rental Machine Podcast. And um, he's also the co-founder of the Va Vacation Rental Machine Formula, uh, an online training. And uh, before we uh, speak with John about this uh, or about uh, Airbnbs and all that, uh, I want to uh, remind you that if you like our show, CREPN Radio, there are a couple of things you can do. Uh, you can subscribe, like, and share the program. And uh, please consider leaving a comment. We always love to hear from our listeners. Also, if you'd like to see how handsome our guests are, uh, be sure to check out our YouTube channel and you'll find us at Commercial Real Estate Pro Network on YouTube. And uh, also, uh, please consider subscribing. With that, I will want to uh, welcome my guest, John, welcome to CREPN Radio. Thank you, Darren, thank you for having me on. It is a pleasure to speak with you and your audience. Well, I'm so glad uh, we were able to make this work uh, and uh, looking forward to our talk. Uh, before we get started, if you could share just a little bit about your background with the listeners. Gotcha. As you said, I started out as an IT professional, still do that by day. That's my full-time job. However, I stumbled upon uh, short-term rentals just as a pet project to just fund some extra money. And it turned into this monster of a thing to where right now I have over 40 apartments or homes that I manage. Uh, and I'm actually just excited to bring that to a bunch of different people and also to try to grow my portfolio. So one day when I'm stressed out enough, I can go ahead and just switch over and do this full time. But I'm all about systems and standards and that makes this business easy. And I'm really in this whole thing just to tell people how easy it could be and how they can create a nest egg on the side. Awesome. Well, the side hustle as they call it, uh, sounds like you've, you've, uh, definitely got a little more than a side hustle. Um, in, in, as far as the, uh, the short-term rentals, um, I was wondering if you could first kind of define what defines a short-term rental. Gotcha. And then, uh, maybe talk a little bit about how you got into it. All right. So short-term rentals are really classified as any rental that happens within 28 days or less. So anything that within the month of February, shorter than that, that's a short-term rental. Uh, anything longer, that means six months to 12 months is technically outside of that range. Um, but then you have your yearly rentals, which are really what people think are long-term. So there's short-term, mid-term, and long-term. Gotcha. All right. <clears throat> and then as far as the, um, how you got started, what, what uh, you know, I think typically people... Well, Airbnb is a, a fairly recent uh, phenomena. Um, can you tell a little bit about how you got in, into it? Yep. Um, I was a Homevestor franchisee, which basically meant I was one of those We Buy Ugly Homes people. That's the national brand that, that's out there. Um, I was visiting another franchisee who was having like some great success out in California, who was also in my class when I went to study. Um, so I'm out there visiting him and it's, um, I think it was Long Beach or somewhere around the beach. I can't remember ex the exact location, but it was a, it was either stay at an Airbnb for the first time or stay at the Ritz. There, there were really only the two options because I was going to be there for like 15 days or so. I said, well, I really don't want the hotel feel. Let me stay at this Airbnb. I got there and I discovered it was in a regular REIT and I was like, wait, this is just a regular apartment building. I can tell nobody lives here. I can tell that it's set up just for guests. And I already know how much they pay because it's marketed, right? They pay 
uh, I want to say it was like $2,700 for this one bedroom apartment. And I'm paying $170 a night, did the math. And I was like, wow, um, this is this is unique. I mean, I, I really know the cost. I mean, what are utilities cost on top? So this guy has to be raking in $1,000, $2,000 a month just by renting this place out. That stayed with me for two years before I really acted on it. One day, I just happened just to flip a home and... I sold it and I got my money and I was just thinking that was a lot of work for this amount of money. <laughs> what can I do with it now? Like, you know, you're running from capital gains and you got to find the next deal. And I just said, okay, you know what? Remember that idea I had a couple of years ago about trying to pursue this. I just started going out, trying to find apartments, buying them or renting them in a business name. And um, I finally got an apartment or two and that grew to four and the money just started coming in and that was really the start of this monster um, that is technically my rental arbitrage portfolio slash co-hosted portfolio so just to make sure i'm on 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 the same page here so you're not these are not uh, properties you own they're properties that you're leasing that you're then releasing or subletting on a on a short-term basis Yep. So uh, there's a couple of different strategies. And the first strategy that you might hear a lot of people talk about is rental arbitrage. The best way to think of it is I rent from somebody to re-rent or sublet. Um, of course, with their permission, uh, that is key. You want to make sure you're doing it with that. The next way of doing things is to co-host a property. That technically means you're the owner of the property and you allow me to manage just like you would a long-term rental manager manage the home for short-term rentals, and you see a big jump in the revenue that you generate for our month in and month out. Outside of that, uh, there's the Burr method, which we all should be familiar with, with, right? That's when you buy, you renovate, you refinance, you get it all right going. Now your exit is Airbnb or short-term rentals. So you, I mean, this is kind of an interesting uh, twist on this because a you've stepped out of all of the maintenance uh, kind of headache of a landlord. Uh, you also don't have the investment needed for the acquisition, uh, the financing. Uh, you don't have the equity kind of a, a gain or any kind of ten thirty one or any you know what are you going to do with any, any? It's just straight up in, income, right? Passive income is that. It is straight cash generated monthly. Literally, the reason why the program that we created is Vacation Rental Machine is because this is a machine. It's an engine that just spits out cash. And yes, it is very lightweight on the maintenance and the kind of oversight that you would have versus owning the property, having to renovate it. Um, really, the down payment, right? If you were to take $40,000 and put down on the home, technically that's four units for me four units can generate me around $1,500 a month. So for, I mean, per unit. So yeah. now we see how the cash kind of just starts flowing in versus a regular rental, which I might make on a good day, $500 a month in profit. So it's like three times with the less amount of money. Okay. Yes. You can say, I don't have the equity. I don't have the actual physical asset. Um, but what I do have is a nice revenue. And if we listen to Rich Dad, Poor Dad, he says, invest for revenue or cash flow. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> and, and then also, um, you know, if things do get tough, if the market dries up or whatever, all you've got is a lease that's, it, it yeah. ends and you're done. You don't have the weight of a mortgage. Yeah. Um, I, that's, that's fascinating. I, I hadn't, um, I, I guess the, the way it's always been, um, laid out or presented to me has been more on the ownership rent model. And then the rent being more of a, um, just a, just a way to accelerate your income stream as opposed mm -hmm. to the, um, the traditional long-term rental uh, where you make the little spread and it's kind of more the equity play, I guess, long-term, even though that, you know, rich dad, poor dad, uh, promotes the, uh, um, the revenue stream, I think that uh, for most, it, there's, it's more of some sort of an equity thing in the in the end, mm -hmm. in the, the, unless you're flipping and you're doing a lot of the the burr uh, kind of stuff. But um, interesting. Um, 
Well, so tell me about how you go about selecting a market uh, that you get in. And uh, then as we go through this, I, uh, where I'd like to get to is kind of understanding the way things were operating pre-COVID to, you know, the, the situation that we're in, where we're in right now. All right. So really the first thing that you want to do is before you go and look at a place, you really want to figure out who's going to come stay. And that really could be based on the location that you're at. So let's just say you're in Orlando, Florida. Um, You automatically know you need to house families because that's the draw. That's the type of people that kind of come in and out of there. Let's just say we're going to Chicago. Okay. Well, Chicago It's got a big business presence, so you probably just need a single bedroom place. So once you identify the type of person that you're actually going to have come in and stay with you, that helps you know what you need to go out and look for. I would highly just say don't go get a three bedroom place in Chicago because there's probably not going to be enough people that travel with that many people to come there versus I wouldn't say just get a one bedroom place in Florida because what are you going to do about all the kids? The kids need a place to go. I don't want them jumping on the bed with me all night and we're going to Disney. Right, right. <laughs> That's funny. So, so more of just kind of like a think through, um, I mean, you're not worried about schools. You're not worried about, uh, you know, em- employment, I guess, would be maybe a sense if you're looking for people that might be traveling to or from, like you mentioned, Chicago with uh, professional kind of downtown stuff. But I guess more just understanding the the attraction uh, as mm-hmm. opposed to uh, the the long term um, you know fundamentals that that, uh, that somebody looking for a neighborhood uh, would correct. look for. Correct. Um, there there's a thing called walk score. Um, you know that is one thing to really kind of look at. The higher the walk score, typically the 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 better the the rental is in general. Um, but really what that means is you're in a metropolitan area, so you have the most opportunity to grab people. But that doesn't mean if you're in a rural area that you can't list it on any type of short-term rental anything site like Airbnb, VRBO, whatever. Uh, that really just means you need to play up on the experience that the guest is going to have. So for instance, if you got like a little uh, pet farm or something like that, you can have those attractions where people come They can stay, they can play with the animals, or maybe they can come plant some crops for free. Um, Just give people an experience that they won't have. A lot of city goers will go out and just say, I'm going to go get dirty. I want to go do this. I can't do it anywhere else. Right. So that's one of the advantages of uh, short-term rentals. Uh, That's one of the things that Airbnb started out with uh, doing great. They really built a experience-based traveler. I'm trying to think who, who I can't remember who um, started that uh, Airbnb. Uh, who who was the, the founder of Brian Chesky? Okay, I think th- there was an interview I heard on um, some podcasts, and they were talking about the experience and and about from the beginning. And in the beginning, I guess they were going out and taking pictures of the properties themselves and getting the you know the learning from their their host on how to do this kind of thing and. And, uh, but, it, but again, it, it, it kind of that experience model is really what I remember resonated from uh, the interview there. So um, well, that's great. So what, t- tell me what market you're in. You said you've got 40 of these right now. I'm heavily based in Virginia um, and DC, uh, also in New Orleans. And we manage a couple down in Florida. Okay. Gotcha. And uh, so let's talk about your marketing. Um, uh, being an IT guy, I'm, I'm assuming, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you, you might be prone to systems and, and uh, you know, not doing everything, uh, you know, handcrafted solutions every time, but you have more of kind of a steady like auto, auto play. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And, and start with, I guess, the marketing too, if you could. Gotcha. So, so marketing in the business, really, if we really think about all the booking channels, you should use them as all of your available marketing channels. Why? Because they pay for ad spend to actually grab new people. So Airbnb will pay for people like commercials and stuff and we'll get it put on TV. That's more draw that you have. Booking.com, TripAdvisor, 
all the places that you would go and book your own travel, you can post your listing on those platforms and have it as a potential option for them to book. So that's the easy part of marketing is you just put it on there for them. They take a commission from the actual reservation, um, but you also can direct book or have your own website and drive people or repeat customers to your website. Um, I do a lot of pounding the pavement. So when I'm looking for my business travelers, I'm really going to go to the businesses that are around the unit and just let them know, hey, I'm here. Do you have anybody that ever comes and stays? And that has been one of those methods that kind of helps sustainability across the year because, hey, you know, this place is going to have at least four conferences a year and they're going to need at least every place that you have available in this one particular location, whether it's two, four or eight. They're just needed because they, they have all these people coming. So when you start to like reach out to them and they start booking your place, um, that's easy marketing because one, they're going to get it booked for you Two, the people that come and stay, if they have a good experience, they're going to tell other people. And most of the time, what I find in DC is those people will come outside of their business trip with their families to come explore the museums and everything else around. So it's always a good thing to kind of go out and just let people know, hey, I'm here. I'm here and available for you. I have a great service. And once they figure it out and they actually stay, uh, that actually, if you do do a good job, they'll come back repeatedly over and over again. Oh, so you do have kind of the, the long tail word of mouth uh, kind of thing if you're uh, marketing to the, the local um, attractions as far as opportunities. Um, when, when you you do that, is it again primarily uh, attraction based? I mean, is that, are, you, are you looking at, uh, you mentioned conferences, um, that mm -hmm. makes sense. I presume like conference centers or you, do you have, what would be somebody, what would be something to look for when you're out uh, kind of checking out the area? Uh, literally, I just go to a map and I, I just look within maybe a mile radius, sometimes a half mile if it's really dense. And I'll just go and I'll just send something either to the business by email. I might give a phone call depending on the type of business. Most of your consulting firms, they, they have people that come in and out. Um, and hospitals are great, right? They have guests, they have outpatient treatments where people might get, you know, go in for surgery. Uh, but they are not able or not comfortable flying back home just yet. So they need a place to kind of stay close. They don't want to go upstairs, stuff like that. Those are great ways to just have some, some people come and stay uh, without taking on the extra spend of, hey, I'm going to go do some SEO um, generation. And, you know, that's just a bucket that you continually just throw in. Uh, and I think when people start out, they might think that it's a good idea to just go ahead and start. But remember, the travel industry is very, very, very populated. There's so many yeah. places, people, companies that do all of this stuff. You can never really compete as a sole owner of whatever uh, to grab somebody. So you have to leverage what you can. No, that's a great point. I mean, especially if you're, you're local and somebody's coming in from out and they're looking for a place to stay and they mention... Uh, where's a good place to stay. And, you know, especially if they're, you know, if, if, if it means like renting a car and traveling, you know, great distance or I can walk there as opposed to not having to mess with that. Um, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. So that's, that's awesome. Um, so has that been primarily uh, one of your best lead sources as far as that the, is uh, the best. Now, of okay. course, I, I will have to say I did go out and I did try to do some SEO stuff, some blog things and stuff. It just wasn't fruitful. And um, that's one of your lessons learned is, hey, uh, if I go out and I spend $400 a month and I don't make a single dollar from it, I need to stop spending it. Uh, I, I rather just send this email to this directed person. Right, right. No, it's it, so true. It, it's uh, the the internet's a willing, uh, you know, they're 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 glad to uh, take all the advertising money you want to spend. Um, yeah, worse yeah. than casinos, right? <clears throat> yeah, it's it's definitely true. Um, so, in normal times, conferences, I would guess, would be a great uh, opportunity. You mentioned hospitals uh, for procedures and stuff would be a great opportunity. Uh, given that we're in a you know, pandemic, 
Uh, I guess we're we're coming out of it. Um, although I see cases increasing, I don't know. I don't know what that's going to impact look right. like in a week or two. I you know who knows what that'll look like. But um, I guess my question is how how has business been since March? What is it, March thirteenth ish? Kind of kind of a day gotcha. on our calendar here. So. Um, March. March is the start of our high season here in Virginia and DC. It's starting to warm up, uh, spring break, and then the museums are open. Everybody wants to come and visit. So right when all of this hit, there were so many bookings that I had on the calendar. Uh, from the 15th on, they pretty much all canceled. So it was a little depressing uh, at that time just because, hey, I had all this money on the books now it's never going to be realized um, to kind of going through and doing what we call now the pivot, right? That is the pivot from short-term bookings to midterm bookings and even long-term. So because we have a furnished apartment, we technically can market ourselves in any one of those fashions. It's just, you have to accept the differences in revenue when you do that. So when we do short-term, it's higher revenue. Midterm, it's pretty good. Long-term, eh it's the same as somewhat the landlords would get, but you kind of got to think that we're over top of the landlord. So, you know, where the landlord might make $500, well, maybe you can only squeeze an extra $200 on top of it um, just because it's already got the profit built in and you got a furnished place. So there's some value in a furnished apartment. Um, there was a lot of people in this area that needed a place to stay because they got sent back to the US via State Department or whatever. So having some of those alliances has definitely helped because now I have mid to long-term bookings at a decent monthly rate. Now, it's not like I'm making $1,500 a month on each apartment. However, I am be being able to scrape by, I'll say jokingly, with $400 a month on those people that are coming to stay. Um, really, this was a big lesson in seasonality and how to manage cash flow. So... For me, generally, what I would end up doing is have just enough to get through the low season and then get right to the high season. So right around March, I'm like, okay, great. I can spend all the cash that I got because I got plenty of cash coming back. Well, that wasn't the case this time. Um, luckily, I didn't spend it. <laughs> uh, I did get some forewarning about this, so uh, that, that was good. Uh, either way, just knowing and managing cash flow. Uh, that was that was key. Also, some of the SBA stuff did help out. Uh, we were included in on on some of that relief. So all of the other hosts and I believe the gig economy were all included. So that was a good thing uh, that the government did for us. So that's how we got through it. Now, this answer, as far as the recovery, keeps changing technically daily. Because as of the last three weeks, bookings have started to increase. People are back out traveling. And that is a good thing. But just like you just alluded to, I am fearful of a double lockdown. I know cases are going up. Uh, and I don't know. It's, it's possible. But is that when 200,000 deaths or is the news just going to stop covering it and we just won't know? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I've come to the conclusion that nobody knows. <clears throat> um, anybody that's uh, trying to explain this is you know, grasping at what we went through last time, uh, trying to, to uh, you know, find where we are on the line from last time to this time kind of thing. And I've just, I've concluded that this is so different. Uh, the economy was doing fine for most, I mean, there was plenty of concern that we were at the top and it was overdue for a correction. Uh, but the banks were fine. Uh, and employment was good. Um, there was no overbuilding of, you know, units kind of thing. So this is kind of a unique animal. And I've, I've given up on, I mean, I'm listening to it all, but I have given up on uh, saying, Oh, that's what it is. Uh, I think, well, oh, that's interesting. Um, because I, you know, I, I just, everybody I talk to is, is got, either an opinion or, you know, we share ideas and stuff and, you know, kind of think of where things are at. But I honestly, I mean, the, you know, the stock market is 
almost back to where it was. Um, today is, uh, what are we at, June 10th? 10th, yep. Uh, as we record this. Um, who knows what uh, the next several months will play play out and stuff. But to, to the point about the, the uh, um, you know, whether or not we have an infection, I have a question for you about uh, turnovers. Yeah. You know, when, when, you, when you have a, uh, a long-term rental, it's a pretty big ordeal. Somebody is announcing they're going, hopefully, they don't just leave in the middle of the night. Um, they take all their stuff with them. Hopefully, you don't have uh, a place left over with stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you, you basically may have to repaint, recarpet, whatever you might have to do. In this situation, you're basically similar to a hotel. Um, right. You've got a uh, nightly guest. Uh, they've left. Um, sheets, linens, clean. How do you how do you do that in a normal situation? And then tell us what you're doing now, given the the concern of uh, COVID. All right. So yes, just like a hotel, uh, we have turns, which is what we call them. Um, pretty much before COVID-19, we would go in, strip the linens, you know, mop, similar to you calling a maid over to the house. We would do all of those things, but because our places are cleaned pretty frequently, it's not like a deep clean every time, right? We're not, we don't have to wipe windows or anything like that if somebody comes and stays for a week and then they check out. We do do that on a periodic rotation uh, where we go ahead and just do all the baseboards and all that stuff. But for the most part, turns for us for a one bedroom apartment takes about 45 minutes. And that's really stripping linen, setting the beds, vacuuming, mopping, dishes, stuff like that. Um, uh, Post-COVID-19, we have a lot of extra steps. And these are actually steps that we're going to continue on no matter what. Uh, Just because we've incorporated it in, um, it's not too much of a heavy lift. It's just more of a check. Like, hey, did I... Did I wipe down the door handles with something that uh, is definitely going to kill the virus within 10 seconds or 15 seconds? So we do stuff like that. We also ozone each room before uh, somebody actually touches the linens because we want to make sure that, one, our crew is safe, even though the CDC has recently kind of come out and loosened up some of the transmission from surfaces. We still want to play it extra safe. Of course, my personal team is uh, where I want to keep I want to keep them whole, right? They all are healthy. They all have families. I don't want anybody catching anything from just working and then taking it back home. So we ozone. Uh, we make sure we get all the cert- uh, CDC guideline stuff, and we go back through and we just check everything. Um, we also uh, we ask our guests before they check out if they feel sick, if they have been diagnosed, and if they have, we will block that apartment for the next three days and then go in and clean it and we won't let anybody stay. So we definitely don't want anybody to catch it by coming and staying with us. So we, we, we approach it in two different ways. Oh, that's interesting. How have your guests responded to these, um, I guess the communication from, from you about this uh, um, I th- before oh. and after? Uh, well, everybody accepts the message. I just send it a couple of days before a checkout. Um, they just let us know. I mean, I, I feel like this is just now the normal thing, right? Uh, hey, how, how are you feeling? Are you feeling sick or anything? Have you had a fever? If so, would you let us know? Have you tested? Okay, no, I haven't, but I had a great stay. That's normally the response that I get back. Um, some people do say, hey, but if I said yes, I mean, you still should be cleaning it, you know, whatever. We still let them know that, hey, this is our cleaning process. If you were to say, yes, we would just reserve the unit for three days, make sure that nobody enters or whatever, and then we'll go in and still do the CDC guidelines. Uh, So we just want to make sure that everybody knows that we are actually being safe. And travelers, I think, are liking that more than a hotel at this point. Now, it's interesting because I think that's one of the, uh, the, the, well, the travel industry was, the one that was kind of hit right, right between the eyes with this, um, from hotels to uh, travel, you know, airlines to uh, uh, restaurants, all of that hospitality was really kind of hit hard. Um, you mentioned that uh, traffic is picking back up, uh, bookings are picking back up. How are they tracking compared to what you uh, would have expected or have ex- experienced in, in prior years? 
I would say uh, maybe at a 27% drop from what it would have been this time last year, as far as occupancy goes. And really how I'm measuring that is how far out things are getting kind of booked up. I'm booked up in, in the immediate, but as time goes on, there's more gaps in the calendar than it would be if things just didn't happen. Gotcha. And as far as the uh, the types of bookings, are they more of the midterm, long-term, or are they kind of trending back to the short-term? Uh, we are definitely trending back to the short-term. So some of our mid and long-term guests are uh, either being called back to the country that they came from, um, or um, they are just ending that reservation, or it's just ending in general, and new shorter term bookings are coming in uh, still about five days or so. So that's still very good. Got it. Um, tell us a little bit about your systems. Uh, you mentioned kind of the cleaning and the turning kind of thing, but, but uh, as an IT guy, I'd love to hear a little bit about how you have this set up. I mean, we talked about the different booking sites. Mm -hmm. You know, if I go on one, I like your place, I click. Yep. It's, it's reserved. Assume you yep. have some sort of a calendar. Uh, um, that, go ahead. Go ahead. So, so behind all of that is a unified calendar um, that we call a PMS or, or uh, management system. Uh, everything funnels to there, and that's how you keep double bookings from happening. Uh, pricing is pushed out from there. That is really the the lifeblood of just being on multiple channels. Without it, it's very hard to kind of manage from one to the other. It also does help when you have something that integrates automated messaging. So like all the check-in messages and um, just that general check that we just talked about for COVID that goes out in an automated fashion. So most of the standard communication is just sent via a system. Um, questions outside of what the system can do, um, that has to be answered by a person. And right now it's just me. I don't have any VAs or anything else because I don't see a need or I don't have enough uh, pain to actually just get somebody to go out and do it. Um, the system that I use for messaging has an AI built in so it can identify, hey, this question's about Wi-Fi. Let me just send this Wi-Fi information. And I typed a response that is generic enough to reply back to anything you almost think I sent it. Right. Right. Now it's fascinating that, uh, you know, how much of that can be uh, unless you have some sort of a real urgent problem, but I would think that uh, as long as people can get in and out, uh, you know, you'd be in pretty good shape. Yep. Um, well, th this is fascinating. I, again, just starting from the premise of uh, your leasing a property and then subletting it as opposed to, um, uh, you know, having to do all the purchasing and then, then leasing it. Um, have you, it sounds like you, you mentioned you, you've, you've cleared all this with each one of the, the landlords. Have you run into any kind of zoning restrictions or cities or others that have uh, had, you know, rules or laws that have been created to? Absolutely. Okay. So, um, of course, uh, there are state regulations, there's local, and then there's also sometimes like an HOA in place that says, hey, Although the state allows it, this HOA says you cannot do it. So you really have to look at each different layer of any type of governance to make sure you're okay. And you should do that before you go out and look for a place. But um, most states and cities are somewhat coming around to the idea, um, mainly uh, the metropolitan areas. I have a lot of units in Old Town Alexandria here in Old Town Ale Alexandria, if you've ever come here, uh, it's just one of those like towns where people just like to walk and find the local shops. So without the tourists, technically, who's really going to be buying from the shops on a repeated basis? So they openly welcome um, short-term rentals and just any type of lodging. Yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah. It, it's funny. I know um, uh, here locally uh, in, in Portland, I know there's been some resistance and stuff and a lot of it's been by, um, I guess, you know, probably the people that invested in the hotels in the first place, you know, that are like, uh, hey, hey, you know, we've got this over here. What are you doing? Uh, kind of thing. But, you know, I think the uh, the great disruption of the economy continues. Uh, thank you, Internet. Right. So we, we have that right. to uh, go with. Um, 
Is there any other, uh, you know, keys to, uh, you know, successfully na navigating the, the uh, uh, pandemic that you've, that you've uncovered? Yeah, I mean, literally the pivot, and, and I'll just keep calling it the pivot because um, we all had to do it. And um, the pivot was, was something that we didn't expect, um, but it is something that we learned and it will always be a part of business. I never knew that I can book a place for eight months at a great rate. Um, it just lets me know that, hey, I don't always have to play the short-term game. I can play a little longer play and still be uh, satisfied. Of course, you would do it for the winter months here or the slow season, uh, but then you'd want to kind of kick those people out so you can get back to some higher profits. Well, okay, maybe I, don't, I won't be so much in a rush to kind of kick those people out. I'll continue them until they can't stay anymore, and then I'll just go ahead and backfill some other stuff. It really just helps the overall portfolio in a sense. So before I was looking to create a portfolio that managed seasonality. So for me, that meant in December, it had a high occupancy, maybe like in Vegas. But um, now I'm looking for, hey, let's just try to keep some of this sustainability, keep the cash flow the same year round. How can I do that? Yeah, makes good sense. Um, have you, or are you actively looking to grow your, your um, unit count or? Absolutely. Ooh. Okay. Absolutely. Um, literally, I challenge myself to um, figure out when is too much for me to actually just quit my day job, right? Right now, because I'm doing all the messaging for the 44 units, um, it's still not enough, right? There's, my phone isn't like, just bothering me. It's not messing up relationships or anything like that. So there's really no pain there. And that's really all that I would need to just say, hey, I'm just going to jump into it. Now I do have a small team um, that do run the day to day. I just meet with them in the morning and that's it. So for me, I am looking to grow. I think right around 500 units or so, I'll probably say, okay, uh, enough is enough. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, this is, uh, this is, uh, very interesting. Um, you know, they like said your, your model from a, uh, uh, basically, you know, leasing and then releasing and marketing and turns and having to pivot. Uh, I think that's, a that's, uh, you know, definitely an experience that you can use in any business. Uh, things are going to change and there's nothing that's guaranteed in life. That's for sure. So, I uh, appreciate you sharing it. Um, John, if we could, uh, I'd like to shift gears here for a second. Uh, as I mentioned to you before we started a recording, um, by day I'm an insurance broker and uh, I work with clients to assess risk and, and determine what we can do with the risk. Um, there's a couple of strategies we look at. Uh, typically we consider, uh, can we avoid the risk? Uh, if we can't avoid the risk, then we look to see, can we minimize the risk? And uh, if that's not possible, then we look to see if we could transfer the risk. And that's what an insurance policy is. And um, I like to ask my guests uh, if they can identify, you know, what they consider to be a, uh, or the biggest risk. Um, and just for clarity, I'm not necessarily looking for an insurance related answer. Uh, risk is everywhere. Uh, but if you're willing, I'd like to ask you, John Bell, what is the biggest risk? I'll, I'll answer it in maybe the most common risk that people assume when they think of short-term rentals or specifically Airbnbs, and that is major parties, people messing up your, your place. With my experience, it's not the, the major risk. Um, it is something you can hedge off and this is how you do it. You pretty much need to make sure that you have proper systems in place and technology. And that really looks like you need to have some type of external camera and a noise monitor or a noise monitor in general in every place if you cannot put a camera. That lets you know before anybody else is pissed off enough to contact anybody else or call the police that something is going on that you need to pay attention to and you can back that up with evidence and you can evict the guests and keep the revenue 
without creating a major problem. Got it. Got it. So let me ask you with that, uh, you, you mentioned you've got some that are in varying uh, states, not all of them sound like they're local near you. Do you have people on the ground that you could deploy if, if uh, something like this happened in one of your distant locations? If needed, there is somebody that can go, um, but really we got it down to a science. We can really just communicate with the guests, get it tamed down. Uh, if not, we just go ahead and just call the police and they can technically just handle it for us uh, without us being there. Got it, got it. Well, John, this has been uh, just very entertaining and very educational. Um, where can the listeners go if they'd like to uh, learn more or connect with you? Definitely. Um, you can find all of our resources that we offer uh, through shorttermsage.com. Uh, you can connect with us within our Facebook group, which is the Host Nation. Uh, and yeah, we're always in the group. You can always just ask a question. We're free to answer. Um, if you're looking for management, uh, you can also find that through Short Term Sage or cohostit.com. Got it. John, uh, again, I can't say thanks enough for uh, taking the time to talk. Um, I've enjoyed it. And uh, like I said, learned a lot. And I hope we can do it again soon. All right. All right. For our listeners, if you like this episode, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Remember, the more you know, the more you grow. That's all we've got this week. Until next time, thanks for listening to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network's C-R-E-P-N Radio.